Welcome to Leadership for Society, Reimagining Work Post-COVID. I'm Brian Lowry, a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And today we're talking about the gig economy with Sam Bright, Chief Product and Experience Officer at Upwork, and Melissa Valentine, Professor at Stanford University in the Management Science and Engineering Department and Co-Director of the Center for Work, Technology, and Organization. Thank you both. Thank you for having us. Great. So I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to start with you, Melissa. Can you define the gig economy for us? Yeah, I think um, so. There are a lot of different labels that are kind of relevant to that, but I I like the um, I like the definition that Mary Gray uses. She's a researcher at Microsoft Research, and she talks about any time that you're using an API, like a it's so like a software call. Any time you're using an API to access labor, then you're participating in the gig economy. So labor accessed through an API. That's how I would define the gig economy. Okay, so labor access through a certain type of technology, you think that that's what defines the, the gig economy. Yeah. Great. So, Sam, can you tell us about Upwork and how it intersects with the gig economy? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, thanks for thanks for having us. Uh, when I think about Upwork, you know, we're a work marketplace that connects businesses and highly skilled independent talent, many of whom are entrepreneurs or small business owners uh, who are doing work on behalf of individuals like you and I or all the way up to uh, Fortune 100 companies. And we provide a solution for them to build relationships between clients and freelancers. We tend to view it as much more relational and project oriented than transactional relationships or interactions that are often the associated with the gig economy, uh, such as taking an Uber ride or having a handy a handyman or handy person mount a TV. So from my perspective, anything I think Upwork and the gig economy, while separate, both fit under this like broader umbrella of flexible work models. And so part of the differentiator is that the jobs on our platform have great pay. They have high quality work that's mission critical to businesses. So we serve everyone from, like I mentioned, from one person startups to 30% of the Fortune 100 are clients, including, you know, like the Airbnbs of the world, et cetera. And we find the clients use our platform to connect with different freelancers who are highly skilled. It could be developers, it could be, you know, engineering freelancers to proactively execute major business initiatives. So I see them as adjacent, but separate. Got it. And how do you expect Upwork to evolve moving forward? So the pandemic has happened, work is shifting in all sorts of ways. What do you think is going to happen in terms of Upwork and its evolution in this new space? Yeah, well, I think if I take a step back from, from Upwork, I think it's just taking a look at what's going on in terms of society when it comes to work. I think work as a construct has been disrupted. Uh, we went through this year and a half experiment where many folks who had traditionally believed that work could only be done a certain way, uh, tied to certain previous uh, preconceptions of work, Everyone was sheltering in place in many cases in the knowledge economy and managers had to adapt, workers had to adapt. And I think it led to sort of a, a change and a reevaluation in terms of the perceptions on what does work actually mean? Does it need to be connected to a badge? Does it need to be connected to a work location? Does it need to be connected to a commute? So if we think about that fundamental reexamination of work within society, then you think about as the backdrop, then you think about what Upwork is providing in terms of being a place where work can get done, no matter where you are, uh, no matter, you know, uh, um, we have like over 10,000 skills, so multiple represented. So like, no matter what particular skill you have, uh, that gives us a lot of opportunity to solve customer problems and to provide the control and flexibility that freelancers are looking for in terms of being able to work however they want to. So I see as work continues to evolve, Upwork being at the forefront of that. And part of what we've been doing over the past year as we've transitioned from a single product line company to a multi-product line company is really enabling freelancers and clients to be able to get work done however they see fit. Uh, as changing customer expectations are evolving, our aspiration and our charge is to really lead that that uh, charge and to uh you know fulfill our our vision of being the place where the world wants to work 
That's, that's a, there's a lot going on there. So I'm going to I'm going to come back and ask some questions about that. But let me um, turn to you for a second, Melissa. Uh, I know you've done research on the gig economy. Um, how do you see the gig economy now and where do you see it going as a function of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot that connects in with what Sam was just saying. I think that the pandemic um, culturally made a lot more people aware of the possibility of working remotely. Um, something that's characteristic of work done on Upwork and other platforms like Upwork is that a lot of it has been done remotely. So this is a way of life. It's a way of working that's more common and that's more experienced for people who work on platforms like Upwork. Um, so now that more companies have experience with remote work and can kind of see what it's like um, and how much they can get done, not in the office, um, it I think that it sort of connects uh, like larger kind of older like bureaucratic organizations with the kind of work that's done on uh, like platform based company like Upwork. Um, I think that the difference and this is something I would love to ask Sam about at some point. I think one thing that I think um, I think where there's like kind of a middle area that hasn't been connected yet is uh, between large companies that have a lot of team based work or a lot of interdependent work. We have a lot of complex projects that involve a lot of different functions and a lot of different kind of expertise that's brought together in larger projects. Um, so Upwork traditionally has been more of a market. So it's more like even though they're very high skilled freelancers is it's matching sort of like client to freelancer in more of a market design. Um, my understanding is that that Upwork is moving into more team based projects and more and offering more project based work. But I think that's um, going to be something that people who are interested in the gig economy are going to be watching for because there's there's so much work. There's so much high value work that's kind of right there in between market production and organizational production, if that makes sense. And I guess I'm seeing with with the pandemic, I guess I'm seeing that gap, that sort of space between closing faster. Mm. So I, I'm, I'll let uh, Sam respond to that question in a second. But tell me why I should. I, well, I like I like remote work, so it's, it's fine. And it's also kind of easy, given what I do most of the time I have to teach. I'm in person. But otherwise, like when I do research, I can be wherever. So it, it works for me. But why shouldn't tell me why I shouldn't be worried about the tyranny of re remote work? So all the language is like, oh, it's going to be great. There's flexibility. But in that in that world, there is choice. But let's imagine that organizations decide it's cheaper to have remote work. But I or someone people like someone like me, other people don't aren't really excited about it. Right. So tell me why I shouldn't be worried about this shift. It had what like what are the or better yet, what should I be worried about when we think about this shift? Hmm. Um, so I think this is, I mean, it's such a great question. And this is what I'm seeing a lot of organizations grapple with right now. You end up with the remote work enthusiasts and then the remote work skeptics, and somehow they have to find a way to work together. Um, I think what we're seeing is compromise doesn't really work because it sort of reproduces what's hard about both systems. So if you have a company that has a culture of more remote work skeptics and you end up going more remote and um, to make to make more remote work work you have to do a lot more documentation a lot more like asynchronous coordination and there's a lot of cost to that so you really have to invest heavily into that kind of work um, alternatively if you have people who want a little bit of the flexibility but are relying much more on like real time collaboration, then there's a whole other set of coordination costs to get people into the office at the same time. So I don't know that I've seen this kind of solved and uh, solved in a way that really um, combines the two. I'm seeing more sort of like sorting. People are sort of sorting into like self-selecting into companies that are solving it one way or the other. And Sam, what, what do you think about that? So, I mean, I know that you have a wide range of people who are on your platform. So it's not just um, low wage workers. There are people who are technically very savvy and skilled. But how should we think about how far this is going to go? Right. So would you have your job? Would you do your job via this this form of work? Yeah. So I, I think the uh, um, I think a couple of things. I think, first of all, uh, there are many folks who probably never considered remote work who during the past year and a half realized that there were benefits associated with 
being able to uh, not have to deal with the commute or uh, be able to collaborate in different ways. Uh, for me personally, I have an 18 month old son and uh, my son was, was born at the height of the pandemic and the uh, ability to not be in a commute uh, every day and actually be there for him while he's uh, getting ready or just do our nighttime routines is you know transformative in, in many regards. Uh, so I do think you have these folks who are uh, especially especially different generations who are coming to work for the first time uh, during the moment where remote work is more of an option who are more remote natives. And so uh, just like digital natives who are folks who are very comfortable with you know uh, digital first organizations, I think we're gonna have more remote natives. Um, I also joined Upwork during a moment where everything was done remotely. So I did the entire interview process. I joined Upwork in November. I did, I did the entire interview process over uh, virtually. Uh, I hadn't met anyone on the leadership team or on my own staff. I was sent a laptop and was like, go off and do things. Uh, and so it was only subsequent, subsequently, uh, probably six months in or so, when the pandemic started to get a bit better and folks had, had gotten vaccinated and we were able to rapidly test that I was able to go and meet with uh, some of my my colleagues and meet my boss and meet other folks who were uh, who were on my team. And it was kind of a unique dynamic, probably the only time in my in my life thus far where people who you've never met run up and give you a big hug because uh, they've been, you know, collaborating with you for uh, for many years or for, for not for many years, but for many months. Um, so so that's that's a really interesting dynamic. I think that's at play as well. I think that remote work is going to continue to evolve in that uh, we're going to keep adapting. You think about all the different collaborative tools that have emerged and that continue to emerge as people are learning how to get work done and how to triage uh, during these moments. And I also think that there's there's various spaces on the continuum for, for companies, right? Like, you know, uh, for Upwork, we're choosing to be remote first. So when our offices in San Francisco and Chicago uh, open next month, uh, we're still going to have those physical offices and we're going to give people options to go into those offices as they see fit, but it's not going to be required. And I'll probably go into the office, you know, every, every few weeks or so, uh, and it will create an opportunity for those who are looking to collaborate in person or have those sync points to be able to engage. But the, the one point I want to call out, though, is that when we talk about remote work, some of it is really predicated around remote from what? Because people have been working in satellite offices have been remote for the entire time. It's just that up until now, they've, you know, different leaders have gone and met with them or they've been able to fly back to company headquarters. I think certainly geographically distributed companies or SMBs who have different locations uh, have always had folks who have been, quote unquote, remote from headquarters. It's just now the question is, how much do you have to be proximate to an office? versus you can you know work from home as your office and still be able to engage and connect with coworkers along the way. Mm -hmm. And I also I want to um, draw a distinction right between just pure remote work and like gig work and, and gig we can also use the term freelance right because there's a flexibility that's certainly associated with remote but there's also flexibility and all challenges associated with being freelance. So how do you think about the cost and benefits of the freelance work where they're not really connected to the em employer in the same kind of ongoing, you know, contractual relationship that a regular employee is. How should we think about, about that from your perspective, Sam? Yeah. So I think we've seen an increase in folks who are interested in freelancing uh, as part of the, as part of the pandemic. I think that, you know, we did some research around uh, the, uh, a freelance forward report. We found that 12% of the U.S. workforce began freelancing during the pandemic for the first time. Uh, nearly half of Gen Z professionals are freelancing in some capacity. And about three quarters of the folks who have freelanced said they wouldn't go back. Like you couldn't pay them a, a enough money. Like they love the control. On average, they have, you know, the, or the median number of clients that a freelancer has according to the Freelancing in America report that was done in 2020, uh, over a six month period is six clients. So 
a lot of the freelancers, you're right, there's like a delta between freelancing and remote, though obviously when folks are remote, I think they start to question other assumptions about work and are like, well, why not try freelancing? Why, why not have the flexibility of being full-time at some points, being full-time in moonlighting, being freelance at some points, and just kind of, you know, evolving their careers as they see fit. Mm. I think that, um, I think you do see more and more uh, individuals willing to try out this mode of work uh, because of the control that it gives them. They don't have to put their eggs in one basket. They can upskill at their own pace. They can work for multiple companies, et cetera, as, as they go along. And freelancing doesn't have to be someone something that someone chooses permanently. Like there are people who may decide to freelance for a time and then, you know, become a full-time worker again and then another time move into freelancing again. It's just another option for folks to to consider. And, and Melissa, you know, the, the our economy is built on the assumption of full-time work with an employer, right? Like not just our economy, but the way our lives are set up socially, right? So healthcare and other benefits. When you think about this move toward freelance, what are the concerns you have or what kind of problems do you see arising and what would we need to do to make that viable? Yeah, I appreciate the distinction that you're making there. I think that um, the move to remote has remote top of mind for a lot of us. But I think the questions, the really important and profound questions with the gig economy have to do with the employment relationship, just like you're saying. So previously we have... Um, structured so many of our benefits around full-time employment in organizations. And the United States is a little bit weird in that regard. We have health insurance and retirement. So many things are structured around um, full-time employment. So now with, um, I, I sort of, I'll harken back to what I was saying at the start with the, with the API as like a, as a software call to labor. Um, the reason that I want to point to that because this is this is bigger than Upwork. Upwork is kind of amazing for how long they've been, um, you know, revenue positive, like for how long and for kind of how big they've gotten. Um, but this, uh, the gig economy is, is so much bigger, especially now with um, APIs sort of connecting into lots of other data systems that have like large remote workforces. So you can like have an API call to a pool of doctors. So Upwork has a lot of, you know, software. They have so many different kinds of experts, but you could have it to doctors, to lawyers, to accountants, to, um, I, I met some uh, MBAs who graduated from Harvard Business School and, and now they have like, you can do an API to get like a business plan. So there's so many different kind of labor pools where you can have this call to the large labor pool and sort of like source, source a project on demand. So it's that kind of on demand sourcing of um, high value work that that is um, kind of driving the conversation now about the employment relationship that we're seeing. So I've I've interacted with a bunch of different companies that have set up these models where you have some sort of platform and then some sort of large labor force. And um, those freelancers are now, you know, they have like the way that their career trajectory looks is different. The way that their training looks is different. The way that their social group looks is different. So there's so many differences in how this kind of platform and network economy looks compared to what we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. I, and, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, I, I was just going to agree with you that I think that the social safety net that has formed around full-time employment is what people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, I wanted to ask about your thoughts on Prop 22, if you could explain a little bit about what that was and how it played out, that, that'd be really useful. Yeah, so I want to uh, I want to actually s just be clear that I'm not a policy expert. Like a lot of my um, research and expertise is on the structuring of work in the gig economy mm -hmm. and in organizations. So I'm hesitant to sort of speak uh, about the policy implications of, of these. Um, I think the lesson that we can kind of take from it and sort of like what to walk away from that question with is that the employment classification that we've used in the past doesn't apply. It's, it's very complicated to apply the employment classification that we've used for decades to what's going on right now. Let me just give one small example that's actually not related to Upwork or Uber, but I think really highlights what's, in, what's sort of at stake here. So this goes again to Mary Gray's research. She's written a book called Ghost Work. She looks at Mechanical Turk, Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is another platform that sort of sources to a large labor pool. 
And um, that labor pool is doing a lot of the work that trains the data sets that large corporations are using to train their AI. So AI products sort of depend on the Mechanical Turk workforce. Um, that workforce is less seen and less visible than Uber or Upwork, but they have sort of the same issues of not necessarily having uh, the, the safety of like full-time employment. So Mechanical Turk workers might come onto the platform and work for a day and, you know, they'll do uh, like they'll label images, for example, to train a data set. Um, so we don't have a classification. We don't have a way of understanding that kind of employment in our country right now. So we don't have a way to protect those workers. Um, so what Mary Gray suggests, and I think this is right, and I think that Prop 22 sort of relates to this, we need to rethink our employment classification system in a really much more fundamental way. And what does that look like? So we're reimagining. I mean, I won't obviously hold you to it, but re what what is that? What are we what are we trying to accomplish? What's the goal, and how do we? How would you suggest where where would we start even thinking about it? Yeah. So so I really appreciate her um, remarks on this, and I can uh, I can share some of the links to her writing on this. But she sort of rec she sort of argues that what we need first is a cultural change, um, a cultural change where we recognize and make visible the kind of labor that is powering the digital economy right now. Um, a lot of those products sort of depend on the invisibility of this kind of labor. So the more that we make visible and kind of value the contributions of all of the people who are working, then the more that we understand the kind of protections that they might need. Um, to tie it to what I was saying about employment classification, it's really hard to say if these are self-employed people, part-time employed people, full-time employed people, freelancers, entrepreneurs. It sort of defies our historical understanding of employment. Um, so her argument is we need a culture change. Uh, she makes the analogy to child labor laws. Like at some point society was like, well, that's not something we want to do. We don't want to have child labor laws, so, or child labor. So she suggests that we first need a cultural change where we are much better at valuing all of the work that contributes to uh, the economy right now. Um, and then based on that, um, I don't, so I, I don't know if I, you said you're not going to hold me to this. Her argument is that, um, so I think one thing that we should, we're thinking about that we as a society are thinking about is where the benefits come from and how they get attached. Is it from companies? Is it from the government? Things like that. Yeah, because I guess one of the questions I have is who's benefiting right now from this shift, right? Is that benefit being shared equally across different constituents? So consumers, um, people who are doing the work, and then the people who are managing or running the organizations. So do we think in your in your from your perspective, you think those the benefits that we're generating are being distributed equally across those those different categories? Uh, I think that's a really insightful point. I think that's a really good point. Um, I mean, I would be going off intuition. I feel like it's an empirical question that's really important um, and worth kind of looking into. My understanding of where value accrues right now in a very digital economy is sort of owners of data get a lot of value. So the workers are tagging data and kind of creating data sets that are then owned by companies and kind of producing really valuable data sets. So I would I would conjecture that a lot of the value follows the data. And I'm, I'm curious, Sam, about your, your perspective on this in terms of, I'll just focus on the power of the, the employees, or I guess the workers. How do you see this way of working, the freelance, because for Upwork, it's mostly freelance, not, not necessarily gig in the way we think about Uber or Lyft. Um, but how is this freelance style of work um, affecting worker power, right? In their, in their, in their organ well, not their organizations, in the organizations they engage with. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it's, I think it's redefining access for work. I think we're seeing companies change their mind from talent acquisition, which presumes that you own work or own workers, to talent access, which really empowers workers to not just work with you, but work with multiple companies as needed. So I actually think that uh, it's a pretty important shift in terms of providing more access to that I think has the potential to be much more equitable than prior modes of working. If you're not dependent on the old, old good old boys network, if you're not dependent on being two hours away from a company headquarters, if you're not dependent on 
who you know or you know a resume in some cases in order to be able to work and and you know provide for your family and provide for yourself that creates a lot more opportunities i think for uh, workers to not only get things done but build their careers in ways that suit their lives in a very different way and be able to you know work to live as opposed to live to work so uh you know i i can't claim to be a policy expert or speak on those points, but I can certainly say from a freelancing perspective, especially for highly skilled knowledge work, like what we found is that the uh, many of the freelancers uh, uh, choose to um, l like the choice that they that they're afforded through being able to, to you know, participate in a freelancing uh, lifestyle. And in some cases, they get access to companies that probably wouldn't have considered them previously uh, or might not have brought them in uh, through being able to work with work with those companies through a platform such as ours. Uh, an interesting stat too, you know, we we're seeing how it impacts education as well because we we uh, we survey freelancers periodically and you know, even though 81% of them say their college education is useful to the work they do now, of those with a four-year college degree, about two-thirds of them said that they wish they had instead obtained a two-year degree and supplemented their education with online training so they could focus on upskilling on the things that were most interesting to them. And so it's just a, it's just a paradigm, I think, a paradigm shift. I think the social contract is being rewritten and it's giving more power to to workers uh, to decide who and where and how many companies they want to work with in ways that we haven't experienced before. So I think that's pretty exciting, and probably has DNI implications as well in many real ways. Mm -hmm. And companies are still pretty powerful, though. So I wonder what kind of safeguards you build in for the people that do freelance work at Upwork. Like, how do they make sure their interests are protected when they're working with an organization? Yeah, so uh, companies, uh, so freelancers can apply to jobs. Uh, there's multiple ways to work, right? Like freelancers can apply to jobs that clients have posted on the platform. They can actually uh, be invited to jobs that clients have posted on the platform. Uh, and they can get, you know, uh, they can set their own, their own hourly rates, how much they're willing to charge and uh, or flat fixed project uh, fixed project costs and kind of determine like what you know companies are willing to uh, to hire them for the skills that they are they are producing. Uh, we also have you know uh, project catalog which gives more project oriented work so freelancers can actually kind of you know have this browse and buy upfront pricing say I'm going to design a logo for X amount of X amount of dollars and you get two revisions. And so while they're sleeping, someone can hire them uh, to do that work based on, you know, browsing their portfolio. And then we also have, you know, uh, Talent Scout, which actually provides vetting of clients as well as vetting of talent so mm -hmm. that uh, talent get that flexibility in terms of understanding the clients that they're working for. So uh, we have a variety of trust and safety features that we have put in place to protect both sides of the marketplace, uh, talent to make sure they're working with good clients and then clients to make sure they're working with uh, great talent and everyone's learning as as they as they go. Uh, so I think it's really important that both sides of the marketplace are invested in and the flexibility for talent to be able to work however much they want uh, with whoever they want to work for, for however long the duration of time that they want to work with them is truly unique when you think about work uh, as we traditionally thought of it yeah and if i'm and i'm a i'm a, someone who's on upwork and i have a a contract and it goes really poorly like i'm i'm treated poorly like what what, what is my recourse like how do i how do i deal with that if i have a really terrible experience or i feel like i'm being mistreated yeah so we have our uh customer experience team um uh, which i have the uh, good fortune of getting to work with quite closely who, you know, there's, there's paths to, to, you know, file a case and say, Hey, here are the issues. But also because a lot of the work is done on our platform and we have milestones, we could actually check and see, Hey, hey you both agreed on, you know, this work was good versus, versus not. And it allows us to be able to arbitrate in a very uh, fair way for, for clients and, and talent alike. Uh, we have time trackers, we have a variety of different features 
that uh, protect both sides of the marketplace. And, you know, if something goes wrong, then we're there to uh, help support and get to a speedy resolution. And I'm going to go back to, I think Melissa had a question for you. So I'll, I'll bring it back and then Melissa can make sure, keep me honest about it. Um, but often we have, you know, complex teams and organizations now, and that seems like it'd be difficult to put together in the kind of freelance, you know, style of the way at least I understand or I'm envisioning Upwork. So on the employer side, if they're using this model, how do they manage those complex integrated teams? Yeah, so uh, I guess there's a couple different dimensions to that. We have we have enterprise uh, companies who use our use our platform, and they have talent clouds and different pools of of workers who collaborate with them to get different needs addressed depending on the hiring manager that there are the particular needs of the hiring manager, right? So if I'm at Acme Co, I might you know need a certain type of of work done and I'll, I'll get a set of folks that i'll add to my virtual talent bench and i'll work with them over time and someone else will uh you know who's in another function will do the same thing but then in addition to individual freelancers we also have agencies on our platform which are uh effectively uh sometimes are completely independent in other cases there are groups of freelancers so sometimes we'll have really successful freelancers on the platform who decide they want to create an agency and have multiple freelancers who work with them and then clients will engage with that agency uh, at sometimes to hire individual freelancers or just source a variety of freelancers from uh, for a more complex project and so that goes back to my earlier point about this being in my view quite different from gig work because in some cases these projects are quite complex, they're expensive, they're over a long time duration, people are working for, you know, for months at, at a time uh, to be able to uh, support the needs of their clients as well. But I think uh, Professor Valentine is right to nudge that uh, there will probably be, there is increasing demand for talent to not only find each other within the upper community and to not only be able to build their own agencies, but also uh, for potentially other ways to work to evolve. So I think we're paying close attention to uh, what customers are, are telling us and we'll see where things go from there. And, and Melissa, you um, mentioned when you were talking about gig work that Upwork is a little bit different because they've been profitable for a while. They've been doing they've been doing this for a long time. They have a certain amount of scale. But there are other gig companies that are huge um, who have not been, you know, profitable and been dependent upon VC money to keep prices arguably, arguably artificial, artificially low. How do you how do you think about those companies going forward? Like, what do you expect to happen um, when that when those prices start to go up, as in, for example, with Uber and Lyft, it appears that they're starting to go up a bit. Like, mm -hmm. do you think that's viable long term? Hmm. So I think, um, I mean, the the rideshare industry is is also kind of like a peculiar, a, a specific section of the gig economy. So with um, with Upwork. So I wasn't when you were asking the question. I wasn't sure if you were referring to. Um, I've worked with companies that are doing um, things like software development or, um, you know, movie animation or things like that. Um, so I don't know that I actually don't know that I can comment on um, the the kind of uh, industry profitability for Uber and Lyft. I don't know if either of you have have can comment on that. I don't I don't know that I can speak to the ride ride hailing industry. Yeah, I guess I just wonder: is the gig economy in our current social context? Is it viable? That's kind of what I, um, so we can, we don't have to call it Uber or Lyft, but the gig economy, because I would say I'm going to separate Upwork a little bit, right? They're, they're not in the same kind of category as some of the, what I think most of us have direct experience with. And there's a variety of ways that we engage with gig work, a lot of us. I'm wondering, do you think in the current social political space um, that the, the way gig work is set up is that, is in your mind, is that viable? Ah, I see. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, I think there are different trends that are pretending that this will be like a larger a larger part of the economy, like a larger way of working. Um, I think that the gig economy is part of it. The gig economy, as we currently understand it, where you have startups that are creating platforms that connect in with 
networks of laborers, like labor, sure. um, that's part of it. Um, but what I was describing before with, um, actually I can point to the research by Jerry Davis, who's a professor at Michigan. And he has been, his research looks at the population of public corporations in the United States over time. And he's shown that the, sh the number of public corporations in the US is shrinking. The number and like the population and the size of public corporations is just smaller. Um, he, he gives an example of uh, when Circuit City, in 2009, Circuit City li liquidated. Um, they had, I think it was like 30,000 employees and then um, someone bought them and then they became just a website. So now they're just like a website where you're fulfilling orders for electronics. So instead of having a large uh, set of full-time employees, now you have like a website basically where people are able to buy electronics. And what made that possible was an API, right? So we have APIs that are basically connecting different parts of companies. You can now have an API to like marketing, you can have an API to like HR, an API to accounting. So instead of needing to have a large corporation that has each of these functions, you can now sort of have this small, lean staff maybe that connects to different um, functions that you'll spin up from time to time. So I'm hearing a lot of discussion about how there might be kind of small core to a company and then a lot of kind of contingent labor of some sort in the periphery around. Um, <clears throat> so I think that I think we're seeing that that seems likely it's not a question of whether it's profitable. It's kind of it's what's happening right now, I think. I see. And do you see that as exacerbating inequality? So you have like this core of people who are in the company and these <clears throat> and then the I don't know, I'll call it the periphery around or the people who are who are uh, contract with around. Do you imagine like, let's say this is you're out in the workforce. Do you want to be the contractor? Or do you want to be central? Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah, I, I actually have, I have a story about that. Um, so my a research collaboration team and I uh, did a, a study where we used Upwork to create flash teams. We just like had a platform that basically like pulled together teams from Upwork and they worked together. Um, it was published in the New York Times and we got a little bit of attention for it. And we were sort of engaging with people on Twitter about it. And somebody tagged me on it and they were like, if this is so great, why are you trying to get tenure at Stanford University? <laughs> I was like, yes. Great question. Great question. Did Such you respond? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just I've told this story like every day since then. That's how I respond. It's, it was it was such a loud question. It was really important. It's really an important question. Um, yeah. And I, well, I think. There's a lesson to be drawn from it because what I love about my job is actually everything that Sam was describing. Like I have so much flexibility to pick my projects and I have like guaranteed pay. I have like lifelong employment. I have health insurance. I have benefits. So I think people who are working on the gig economy need to like, we, we all, I guess society needs to be careful about all the language that we use about flexibility when we're speaking from a place where we have a lot of benefits kind of built in around everything that we're doing. Otherwise, it is very likely to exacerbate inequality, as you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Sam, what do you think are the limits of the kind of freelance work that Upwork supports? Right. So it's I don't assume that an organization is going to become a fully freelance. I don't even know what that would mean, but fully freelance. Um, what, what are the limits as you see them for the kind of work that Upwork supports? Yeah. So um, I guess a couple thoughts. I think it's probably interesting to ponder how the gig economy and the creator economy are sort of interfacing. And uh, if you think about a lot of the entrepreneurs on the upper platform who are, who are freelancers, like many of them are creators and they see themselves with a very entrepreneurial bent in terms of delivering products and services that then form their, their portfolios and then drive additional work and higher dollars per hour, or higher fixed pro project prices. So I think that's an interesting, uh, an interesting sync point. Um, but I'm continuously surprised by not only the breadth of skills that are on the upper platform, but then also uh, how many companies are realizing areas that they thought may not have been able to, you know, support hybrid work or support freelancing, that they find ways for that to, to occur. So I expect we're going to see more and more of that over time. Now, we're primarily focused on knowledge work. So, you know, I think there are categories where we are not, you know, present or, you know, for whatever reason, it's, we're not the right solution for, for that. But 
we have people who hire and get, you know, uh, hire paralegals. We have folks who have accountants and we have, you know, uh, uh, customer support uh, team members. And, you know, you pick the, pick the arena. We have people who provide music lessons uh, through project, project catalogs. So uh, you pick the arena, uh, knowledge work that can be done virtually or even done virtually, even if the person on the other side of the contract is your next door neighbor and you don't know it, uh, is something that, you know, Upwork uh, supports. And so um, I, I'm going to be really interested to see how those vectors evolve over time, but uh, it's going to be completely driven by the demand that we see from workers. Uh, mm. And as workers want to have more flexibility in their lives and don't want to go back into the office and uh, drive two hours uh, each day to laugh at jokes from their boss they never thought were funny. I think you'll see more and more people uh, choose freelancing and categories that you know we may not even be aware of right now. So okay, here's an. I, I'm still curious about the limits. So let's say I'm a CEO. <clears throat> I'm, our company is completely virtual. Everybody is virtual. Why do I need a CTO or a chief product officer? Why don't I just freelance, have freelance people doing that? Would that is that plausible? Is that possible? Is that plausible? Would that be a good idea from your perspective? Yeah. So I I have heard about companies who are using uh, fractional executives for that very reason. Like sometimes they will stand up organizations with you know a series of C-suite leaders who will sp split their time across you know three or four different companies. Uh, so, you know, people are experimenting with that even today, how that evolve will evolve over time and what the uh, pros and cons of that will be. Uh, I I'm not sure I can speak to that, but I do think that the general trend of us innovating with work, which has had this sort of like really, I think universally shared in many respects, like set of characteristics. Now that, you know, uh, remote work is, is causing us to question things, probably makes us really challenge whether or not some of the assumptions we've had across the board, including that use case, are, you know, truly constraints. Mm -hmm. May I build on that, Brian? Oh, of course, yes. Okay. Um, I Just another story. I, so I've given the, the Flash teams talk to executive audiences um, for the past five years, and I think that their question is what you're asking. Like, what's the limit of this? So I'll present and I'll be like, flash teams, you can like, you know, build this like new team and it will help. And at the start, everyone was like, wow, that's so cool. And then increasingly the question that I get, like starting three years ago, the question I started to get was always like, yes, the problem, it's the problem is not access, it's integration. The problem is always integration. Like, I think people are starting to like buy into the idea that you can kind of access a lot of talent quickly, but integrating what they build is like, is the real challenge at this point, I think. So you think of that as a, a limit right now? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I was wondering if all of this is making me think, what is the corporate structure we have, or at least the way we think about organizations, is that, are you all suggesting that's outdated or that we'll, we're going to move beyond that in the foreseeable future? I mean, because Sam, that's what I, what I hear. I hear you saying that is a, a, a distinct possibility. And I'm curious, Melissa, and Sam, you can agree or not agree with that. I'm, I'm curious. But Melissa, do you, what do you think about that? I, this is the question. I'm, I'm glad that you proposed it like that. This is the question that I think about and talk about with people all the time. Um, and I think we have like a classic theory of the firm. The reason that we have organizations is because hierarchy has just particular coordination properties. It's easier to integrate. There's a little bit easier to have like accountability and to integrate complex work using hierarchy. Like that's that's like classic economic theory, right? Um, so I don't, I haven't seen anything that challenges that idea. I think how, I think this idea of having like core and periphery is probably where we're headed, but having some sort of firm at the center because it coordinates complex work. Like that's just a structure that coordinates complex work differently. Um, and there's actually a great paper by some professors at MIT that talk about how accountability sort of accrues within a hierarchy differently. So society sort of depends on being able to point to something and be like that company is accountable for this. So accountability and coordination are sort of served by hierarchy. And that's what the firm does. So I would, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now in terms of is how far this will go. Great. And Sam, you have the last word on that. <laughs> well, I, I think that, um, I think that 
we've already seen how work gets done in corporations change quite a bit. Uh, folks who, you know, managed by wa walking around or who were used to FaceTime or what have you, all those things had to had to evolve during the during the pandemic. And then people started to adapt the way that they managed in very different ways, right? Like uh, weekly Slack updates started to and, and virtual all hands and virtual happy hours and, you know, Zoom calls and all sorts of different, you know, dynamics started to come to bear. I think that there are parallel tracks of innovation that are underway. I think folks are, you know, systematically trying to build tools that will reinvent and reinvigorate the workforce. And in parallel, you have these trends of, you know, the remote natives and remote work underway that I think are going to challenge these assumptions. I do see, I do see a, a value for the concept of a firm, but I think how that is constructed, configured, and even, you know, the worker composition of it over time is we're going to be experimenting with it, I think, as a society for a little while. And that's incredibly exciting because this is a frontier of innovation that I think we've, um, I think there's there's probably been less room for experimentation uh, that is is now being challenged. Yeah, well, I, I mean, well, I agree with both of you that we clearly are going to see a lot of experimentation and it's going to be interesting to see how it all evolves over time. Yes. So thank you both um, very much for talking with me today about it. Thanks so much. All right. So next week, I'll discuss the role of business, philanthropy, and government um, to provide safety to the people. We'll talk to Aisha uh, Neandora, CEO of Springboard to Opportunities, and Dr. William Spriggs, Chief Economist for the AFL-CIO. Thanks. See you then.